Hey, Matt Techman here from Elucidations. Before we get going, I just thought I'd put in a quick plug for Pippa. We've been doing our hosting with them since 2016. It's been a fantastic experience. So if you have a podcast, you might check them out. They have great analytics, the service is free, and they make it easy to migrate. So if you're curious, visit their website at pippa.io. All right, thanks. Hello and welcome to Elucidations. I'm Matt Teichman. And I'm Emily Dupree. With us today is Miranda Fricker, Presidential Professor of Philosophy at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And she is here to discuss blame and forgiveness. Miranda Fricker, welcome. Thank you. So blame and forgiveness, I think, is a pretty uh, live topic in, in the zeitgeist today. But nonetheless, I thought it might be interesting to just discuss a couple like standard examples. Of what would be some examples of one person blaming another for something they did? Well, to take a very everyday, trivial kind of example, I think, you know, among friends, for instance, or among colleagues, there can be small wrongs, misdemeanors for which blame can be in order. So somebody, if I borrow a friend of mine's book and take it on holiday without asking her, and then it turns out she really needed it while I was away, that's something for which you might blame me, pro tem. I see, right. So, yeah, these little kind of like slights of etiquette between friends, at least be one case in which we're familiar with the practice of blaming each other for things. Exactly, and we hope those sorts of trivial everyday kinds of blame don't last very long because then I say I'm sorry and she lets it go and uh, then it's all over with. Of course, there can be much more serious kinds of blame which uh, are not so easy to draw to a close somebody's unfaithful to their partner, somebody seriously betrays a friendship, publicizes secrets all over the internet. These sorts of things tend to solicit longer-term blame and much stronger blame. And we think of blame as something, I think, that if it's in order at all, it needs to be proportionate to the wrong that's been done. And that's just one of the kind of rules of appropriate blame that we naturally go by, it seems to me. If somebody borrows my book and goes on holiday, but I blame her deeply and forever and I don't let it go and I say this is the end of our friendship, we'd say that my blame is ridiculously disproportionate for such a small little wrong as borrowing a book without asking. Right. And if she borrows your car without telling you and crashes it into a ditch or something and you treat it as though it's nothing, maybe that would be like not blaming her enough? I agree. I mean, uh, some people will differ on this, but I think the issue of proportionality and blame cuts both ways. So it's proportionate and appropriate to blame people not too much for what they've done, but also there's something wrong about not blaming people enough, it seems to me. And the uh, obvious sorts of examples are when you might observe of a friend, oh, he's just letting his partner get away with mistreating him endlessly and he keeps letting it go and he never seems to blame her. What's he thinking? He needs to stick up for himself more. That would be an example of not blaming someone enough, it seems to me. Not blaming someone disproportionately where it's insufficient rather than too much. Yeah. So it seems like there's some sort of Goldilocks principle going on here. You want to make sure that you're not giving too much blame, not too little blame. You want to make sure it's just right. <laughs> I agree. However, I would also want to add that I don't think that blame is compulsory. I mean, it seems to me there can be also situations rather different from the one I just imagined, but where you might observe someone keeps getting wronged by a friend of theirs or a partner or an employer, or whatever it might be, and they choose to let it go. They choose just not to go there with the blaming energy. They might have good reasons for that. They might know that it's pointless. They might know the person will never change. They might think that going in for blaming them is going to be more destructive than is worth it. And I think all these rather more pragmatic, sometimes prudential reasons do govern what's appropriate in a given circumstance. So I'm certainly not someone who would argue that blame is required even when it would be appropriate. What's the difference then between blaming someone and simply attributing to them a causal role in some misfortune that happened? Yes, well I think there are, obviously there are different accounts of exactly what blame is. I think of blame as minimally a finding of fault. Minimally it's a judgment that the person was at fault for doing or failing to do what she did or failed to do. 
And so there's an implicit kind of accusation involved, either just in that judgment or in any speech act, any spoken kind of blame that expresses that judgment. So I think of blame as a finding of fault, and that tends to come out in the form of accusation. It could be a very strong accusation or just a very, very mild accusation, like, hey, I wish you hadn't taken my book without asking. It was really irritating. I wanted to read it on holiday. That's a kind of mild accusatory tone that one takes when one expresses blame, even in that gentle way. What are the different ways someone could be at fault? Is it always failing to do a duty? Or is it failing to do things that would be nice but you didn't have a duty to do? That's a good question. I think that blameworthiness, which is what I'm tying the notion of being at fault to, there was always, of course, a bit of slipperiness about how people choose to, to use the words. I think blameworthiness tracks duty, roughly. I'm not big on using the word duty. I don't intend it in any specifically Kantian sense, for instance, but failing to do what you ought to do is the sort of thing that blame attaches to. Failing to be better than most people are is not the sort of thing that blame attaches to. So I think we have, uh, we naturally live with a kind of local understanding of what's in order, what's required around here. And if people sink below that level of kindness or of benevolence or of honesty, etc., etc., then they're at fault for that failure. Um, but if they, on some occasion, are less than superlatively generous or less than heroic, we don't regard that as something that people are at fault for. We just noted about each other and we find it average and normal. So I'm interested in this thing you mentioned earlier about there's one set of questions which is something like, is what the person did blameworthy? Like, do they, in some sense, deserve to be blamed for what they did? And then it seemed like you were saying there is sort of a separate question, which is, if I blame them, is it going to work? Is it going to be effective? Is it going to have the desired consequence? And um, yeah, I'm interested to hear about like, what is it for me to blame somebody and for it not to take? Yes, well, I think I just need to explain my approach to blame to set it up to make it clear. So I, I think a good way to approach explaining certain practices or certain concepts which evolve culturally and historically, so they're going to be quite diverse in their formation, is not to look for a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for what blame always is, a strict definition, as philosophers say, but rather to pick on or hypothesize a paradigm case of it and then ask what that paradigm case really does for us. What's its role in our shared moral life? What's its point, we might say, for short? Now, I hypothesize that the paradigm case of blame is communicative blame. So blame which serves a special sort of function, namely, you, if you hurt me and I communicate my blame, the fact that I find fault with you for it, to you, what I'm aiming to do in engaging in communicative blame is to prompt you to recognize, perhaps you know, with a feeling of remorse and sorriness, the moral significance of what you've done. Don't you see that was kind of a mean thing to do the way you treated me the other day? I'm like tapping you on the shoulder and giving you that, that mild accusation in order to solicit shared moral understanding on your part. So you come to see what you did kind of in the same perspective as I see it. So if we stand back, we might say a significant part of the point of communicative blame is to align the moral perspectives of the person who's been hurt and wronged with the person who did the wrong shared moral understanding. And in my view, the culprit, the wrongdoer, can't really have shared moral understanding of something wrong that he's done unless he feels a certain remorse for it. So it's a kind of pained moral understanding as you grasp, oh, what I did last week really amounted to a betrayal of a friendship or a betrayal of a colleague. And that sinks in and it's a painful recognition of what one's done. So the shared moral understanding between the person who's been wronged and the person who's done the wrong is going to express itself in a remorseful kind of grasp of what one's done if one's the wrongdoer and an accusatory feeling of some kind, may or may not be angry, but it'll always be kind of accusatory on the part of the person who's being wronged, hence the accusatory nature of communicated blame. So that, that's a kind of exchange between the wronged party and the wrongdoer that I think substantiates 
the positive, morally progressive point of communicating blame. And I like to argue for that in the face of those who say, oh, blame is always just negative, blame is this angry, miserable, or maybe cruel, or kind of uh, egotistical thing that we'd really do better off without. I disagree. I disagree with that blanket negative view of blame, because it seems to me communicated blame, when it's proportionate, when it's appropriate to the context and so on, is an essential kind of moral glue, a mechanism of moral alignment that reaffirms shared values or indeed can create shared values anew through this mechanism of the wronged party trying to prod and prompt the person who did the wrong to see it the way that the wronged party sees it and thereby recognize the significance of what they've done. Do you think that blaming is the only way to establish this shared moral understanding. It's the only way to develop the moral glue in our communities. No, I would never say that. I think it's, however, a perfectly sort of benign, useful, transitory method, so long as it doesn't get entrenched and unexpressed and as it were, flower into hideous ressentiment of a Nietzschean kind of resentful grudge holding. So I want to affirm it as a kind of ordinary, everyday, useful mechanism. But I certainly would never say it's the only way we can do it. I mean, sometimes people have said to me, hey, we don't have to do this blaming thing. Why have any kind of negative or accusatory feelings? Why not just neutrally point out to the other person? It makes me sad when you do this. And in fact, I think it is a little bit infantilizing sometimes. That's the way people talk in childcare situations. It made me sad when you hit me. <laughs> um, those mechanisms can be very useful and they needn't be infantilizing and certainly we need them when ordinary communicative mechanisms of blame have broken down or have become entrenched. I mean if you're in the middle of a difficult divorce and you need to talk to each other maybe with a therapist present about the moral truths of the matter or the emotional truths, you do very well to ascend to that, let me report to you how I feel when you treat me this way, to ascend to that level rather than staying at the immediate moral engagement, emotional engagement of accusation and defense or accusation and uh, acquiescence into remorse because those mechanisms have kind of broken down by then. So certainly I think there are other more neutral ways of doing it and perhaps it can be useful in everyday life even when things haven't broken down to ascend to that higher level and just report to the other person how it made you feel or point out the reasons for not doing this thing. I, maybe that can be useful but I don't really see it as preferable for all the time, all things considered. And I suppose part of that betrays uh, an affection I have for the reactive attitudes, our ordinary human responses. I mean, if we all just responded to each other's wrongdoings by calmly pointing out reasons, there would be no drama, there would be no subject matter for theatre. <laughs> I think it's an essential part of human life that we're passionate creatures, and those passions have an essential role to play, it seems to me, in moral interactions, even though we need to be able to moderate them and leave them, put them to one side on occasion when they're not functioning well. But I don't think it Personally, I don't find it an ideal that we transcend them all the time, though I, I accept that some others will have reasons for finding that ideal appealing. One thing I find so interesting about the paradigm of blame that you've presented is how rare it is and how often when we think of blame, we instead think of the pathological cases where either something is out of proportion or, I think more often, people are using the practice of blaming for some other motive, either status seeking or the infliction of, of emotional harm or something like that. So I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the pathological cases of blame. And sure. No, I'd love to talk about the pathological cases because they're fascinating. I always think that failures and deteriorations and degenerate versions of things are the more philosophically interesting very often. But I would first like to say I don't think that ordinary communicative blame is so rare. I, I think it's a really everyday phenomenon, but quite often it's kind of bypassed because if you're in a community where people have shared values, you can skip over the blame. You know, I'll do something a bit thoughtless to a colleague and before he's kind of said anything to me, he may have registered, oh, that was a bit thoughtless the way she just uh, ignored my opinion in that situation. I'll have said, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't 
kind of hear what you said properly. Very often, if people have shared values, they've apologized before the blame has really got to go anywhere. So I think that's part of the reason we don't notice it if we're living in a relatively conflict-free zone. But I mean, families are not conflict-free zones. I, if you think of family life and what it's like to be a teenager growing up in a family, I think most teenagers will, will tell you there's plenty of blame flying around in their family. So whether we notice blame and its appropriateness or not depends a lot on what the the moral circle is that we're living in at that moment. However, yes, let me uh, respond to your interest in the pathological cases. Um, they're fascinating and they're a perennial human tendency. And I think what makes them so philosophically interesting is that the functional case where, say, you wrong me and I communicate my blame to you in a lovely, effective, moderated, and appropriate and proportionate way, which you then acknowledge, this is an ideal, that, because I've been wronged, is intrinsically precarious. I'm very likely, because I'm hurt, to be spilling over into something excessive. Furthermore, if you and I are old friends, and you've done that to me lots of times before, that's another ingredient that pushes me towards excess. And as it were, you get these cumulative responses that people have towards each other, you know, partners, spouses, old friends. There's a, an accumulation of things which we also have to manage, and it can be an effort to keep our responses proportionate. So I think disproportionateness is an intrinsic risk to this practice, and that's part of what makes it interesting. There are other forms of pathology which are less intrinsic but just as interesting. One is that if you wrong me and I am communicating my blame to you, if my view is correct that part of the thing my communication is aiming at, whether of course it's in my mind to aim at this or not some other matter, but part of the, pra the aim of the practice in which I'm engaging is to try and change what's in your head, change your attitude so that your understandings are more closely aligned with mine, then I'm communicating this blame to you with designs on what's in your head, if you like. So I'm trying to remould you, to get you to see things my way. That's an effort of moral influence. And efforts of moral influence, which I think are I've already said, I think are essential to reaffirming and regenerating or generating new shared moral understandings. They're also intrinsically prone to be the vehicles of bad moral values. So communicative blame only serves a morally progressive function if the values that are in fact being reaffirmed or generated anew are good ones. But if we're in a society where people of my group are assumed to be socially superior to people of your group and I'm communicating blame to you for you being, say, what I regard as impolite or disrespectful to me, perhaps because really you weren't being sufficiently deferential, then what am I doing? I'm trying to change what's in your head so that you think of me as superior to you. That would be a form of moral control, a kind of moral oppression, or if you like communicative blame, just being the vehicle for a moral oppression. So. That's another interesting way now through the content of the values that are being affirmed or generated anew that communicative blame is a mechanism we should regard as in itself morally neutral and it ha as it were prone to being used for bad ends rather than good. One example of a pathological case that strikes me as relevant to this discussion is victim blaming and the related phenomenon of gaslighting where somebody in the face of being blamed for a particular wrongdoing directs the conversation in such a way that the victim in fact ends up endorsing the wrongdoer's view on what happened. Just as one example, you can think of a case of verbal abuse where somebody says something that was totally inappropriate and then upon being confronted with the inappropriateness of what they say, they in fact turn it around and make it the case that the recipient of that abuse in fact caused it and it was their fault. So according to your paradigm of blame, this has been somewhat successful because a shared moral understanding has resulted. But as you just described, the shared moral understanding isn't tethered to a value that we as neutral observers would want to endorse. So how do we ensure that our blaming practices don't turn into the gaslighting, the victim blaming, the problematic cases of blame. Yes, I mean, that's a perfect example of the ways in which communicative blame can 
function to bad moral ends, and it just depends on what the values are that are being peddled and the, what the values are that win the day. I don't really think there's any silver bullet or any method that can be prescribed to how we avoid having oppressive or otherwise bad moral values in our value system. It'll have different aspects. One aspect is you want critical possibilities and the perspectives of victims to carry as much weight as the perspectives of anybody else. So this, for me, is an interesting connection with what I call epistemic injustice, and in particular testimonial injustice. Testimonial injustice is something I've theorized as somebody receiving a reduced level of credibility in what they say from a hearer, owing to prejudice on the part of the hearer. So in the sorts of cases you're mentioning there, the person who is doing the blaming, when she expresses or communicates her blame, and it might be to the culprit or it could be to a third party, her word isn't receiving the credibility that it should. Now, I'm assuming that's owing to prejudice of some kind. It could receive less credibility than it should because of other sorts of negative pressures, like there being a kind of prevailing ideology which makes people fail to see the reasonability of her point of view. And that need not be construed strictly as a prejudice, but because of my own theoretical inclination, I'm kind of inclined to see it as a prejudice. But there can be certain things which mean that communicating blamers don't receive the credibility they deserve. And that's one kind of impact that can facilitate its going wrong in the ways we're imagining. So a kind of epistemic equality, background epistemic equality among citizens, if you like, is going to be required to ensure that when people communicate blame, they're not on the receiving end of an unfairly reduced level of credibility. And that's going to be one important aspect of it. And another important aspect is just that we want our moral values to be good ones. And there's nothing I can say that will, as it were, guarantee that or even really substantiate exactly what that idea is, except the hope that our ongoing critical debates and understandings about what our values are and what they should be will be not only the result of an epistemically egalitarian discursive climate so that everyone has their say and everybody's points of view can in principle come to the fore and carry the weight that they deserve, but also that there aren't any other seriously distorting factors in terms of other power relations and so on. So yes, we want our values to be as good as they can be and that's going to be a whole load of different ingredients which contribute to that, but I think an important one is background epistemic equality. So when you described this sort of paradigm case of communicative blame, it sort of reminded me a lot of like teaching. And I wonder if you think that's a helpful way to think about it. Like my friend did something wrong. They didn't understand that it was wrong. So I'm giving them kind of a moral lesson. I'm helping them come to understand this thing they didn't understand before. Do you think that's a helpful way to think about blame as a kind of teaching or, or does that analogy break down? I think it's helpful as long as we're egalitarian in our conception of teacher and student in this sorts of case. I think we learn from each other all the time through this process of communicative blame. So yes, learning from each other. If that's teaching, then I'm happy with calling it teaching. But a kind of learning from each other might be a more, uh, a safer phrase. And I, that's part of why I think it's an essential mechanism, because I think we have a, even if you don't think of human beings as drifting naturally towards selfishness and egoism and so on, but a lot of people do think of human beings like that, we certainly drift towards a certain sort of forgetfulness of others. It's easier to see the consequences of our actions in terms of how they affect ourselves and those in our immediate vicinity. We might not have such a clear grasp of how our words or our deeds affect someone else in the room, someone a little further away from us. So we need them to say, hey, I don't like it when you talk that way or tap me on the shoulder and communicate to me how he finds me to be at fault in my behavior. So I do think that I need to learn from others how the actions that I do or the actions that I fail to do affect them. And I think there is therefore a kind of drift towards forgetfulness or if you like his egoism, which is just built into our predicament as people who do things and say things and forget some things and uh, don't think too carefully about how we express ourselves. We, we might hurt people without realizing. So we need those people to come forward and say, talk differently, think differently, act differently. And that's a learning process, and it's an intersubjective learning process between equals, is the idea. So yes, I think, I think teaching each other or the education model is, is not far off. Okay, yeah, so maybe it's like 
as long as we have this model of teaching where during period one, I teach you and you're the student, then during period two, we swap places or something. Maybe it's, you know. Exactly. Yeah. It's a two-way street. But also in any given instance, so maybe if I do something thoughtless and somebody else comes back to me and it communicates blame, maybe a very gentle, courteous kind of blame, explaining to me how the way I put things just now was kind of thoughtless, I might respond and say, really? Do, how thoughtless? Are you sure? I mean, aren't you being a bit oversensitive? And he might say, well, maybe. You know, This is a dialogue we enter into, right? And so it's not like communicative blame just carries an assumption that the alleged wrongdoer must agree. Yeah. That person might come back and say, don't overreact, or hang on, you're not seeing the bigger picture here. This was why it was important for me to do this. And so it's a, an ongoing kind of dialogue. And that, too, I think, helps us see how communicative blame needs to be understood as a two-way learning process and that the kind of um, alignment of moral understandings that it, according to me, aims at as a practice in which one's engaging is not guaranteed to be just a matter of the wrongdoer's perception lining up with the wronged party's perception. It might end up kind of the other way around and gradually at the end of the conversation, me who thought I was so wronged at the beginning of the conversation, I now some come to think, actually, you know what, I do get why he did that. I don't really see it the same way anymore. He kind of explained his perspective and I kind of retract my judgment of him. So let's say someone has blamed someone the wrongdoer has responded appropriately, they've come to see that they did in fact wrong the person, and they're expressing remorse for what they've done, and also a commitment to not doing it again in the future. Is this the point where the blamer becomes the forgiver? Yes. When the model's working perfectly, the way I see it is that given the progressive point of communicative blame is to solicit this remorseful shared understanding on the part of the wrongdoer, then when that's achieved, which in my view it might be achieved without them explicitly apologizing, but obviously an explicit apology or other expression of sorriness for what they've done, that's what shows you that they have, a, as it were, reached a shared understanding with you. That's the point which cues forgiveness. Why? Because the point of the communicated blame has been achieved and therefore continued blame feeling would be pointless and given that continued blame feeling has a, a negative impact it's negative in the sense of the person who's on the receiving end of it and it can be negative in the sense of the person who's feeling that ongoing blame feeling which is now residual I mean it's not going anywhere or doing anything progressive in the world changing anyone's point of view it's just sitting there kind of becoming more and more entrenched and quite likely poisoning the relationship, sometimes poisoning other relationships into the bargain. I mean, let me give an example. I, I suppose a marital breakdown is a kind of classic easy example here. Supposing someone's uh, been wronged in some way by their spouse or ex-spouse, and the spouse has said how sorry they are, and it's kind of meant to be all over, but she just keeps on blaming him regardless. She can't get rid of those blame feelings, even though he's expressed apology. That's very likely to poison the marriage, poison the relationship with children in ways that she doesn't want and nobody wants. It can do no good. So my very basic thought is, once the point of communicative blame has been achieved, continued blame feeling can serve no moral purpose and is very likely to be a negative input into the relationships around the wronged party and the wrongdoer, and therefore you want rid of it. So a key thing that forgiveness does for us as a kind of established moral trope or moral practice is it enables the hurt party to get rid of residual blame feelings and to let it go because they've they've done their job they've solicited this shared understanding so is forgiveness simply relieving yourself of blame feelings or is there some additional thing that happens well I think that forgiveness in itself is just ridding yourself of blame feelings Appropriate forgiveness is ridding yourself of redundant blame feelings, blame feelings that can serve no morally progressive purpose, either because they've done their job already and the person now has this shared moral understanding with you, or, and I know this is controversial, because you're never going to get them to come to that shared moral understanding. So once again, your blame feelings can do no good, not because they've succeeded in achieving their point, but because they never will, or so you judge, 
or perhaps you judge for other more pragmatic or prudential reasons, even if they could achieve their point, it's going to cause too much damage in the process. You could come to a judgment that if you keep on hammering on with this communicated blame to the friend, the spouse, the colleague, you might get there in the end and you might come to some shared understanding, but actually it's going to be too costly and it doesn't matter that much and there are more important things to attend to. Communicating blame and other forms of moral engagement of this emotionally charged interpersonal kind are costly. They take energy, they sap your emotions and they take cognitive energy. So we have to ask ourselves whether they are worth it. And in that sense, I've got a very pragmatic view of the appropriateness of forgiveness and I think sometimes it's quite appropriate to forgive simply because continuing with blame feeling isn't worth it. So the time that it's ripe to forgive someone is either the time at which the blame has been successful as in they now understand why they shouldn't have done what they did or the other time at which it's opportune to forgive somebody would be when it's clear that that's never going to happen. Like it's kind of either, those are kind of the two ways maybe of uh, forgiveness being appropriate? Yes. And I would just add the third way is that people often make a judgment that they don't want to go on being this angry. And it's really not about the wronged party anymore. It's not about do I continue to engage. It might be that the wrongdoer is long gone or dead or is never going to be sorry. All of those reasons sort of make the wrongdoer be out of the picture. And the hurt party, the wronged party, can just come to a conclusion, you know what, I don't really care. It's not about them. This is about who I want to be, how I want to live, whether I want to try and expunge this experience from my life. I don't want to be that angry person anymore. And when you read accounts of forgiveness after really very severe wrongs, that's the sort of story people often tell. Whereas I found in philosophical discussion, People are often saying, oh, you can't just forgive for no reason. You've got to have special sorts of moral reasons to forgive. They must be sorry. Well, I agree. That's one scenario. In fact, I think it's a kind of really basic human reactive scenario which structures our understanding of what blaming and forgiveness is. But I do not think that it's the only proper reason to forgive. I think an excellent and central reason to forgive is my realizing I don't want to go on being this angry. And so in a way, I think of blame as essentially communicative when we're looking for what its progressive, useful moral role is. But I think of forgiveness as, in the first instance, about the wronged party and who she wants to be, how she wants to live, and only secondarily about whether she wants to forgive the person who hurt her, what goods that will be for the wrongdoer to know that she's released from these bad feelings. I, th I regard that as a secondary aspect. So. I slightly surprised myself in coming to this view because my tendency is normally to think of everything as relational, intrinsically relational, right down to the bottom. And I do think that about communicative blame. But it seems to me that forgiveness has such an important role for people who've been wronged, which can be described entirely independently from anything to do with the wrongdoer or the effect of forgiveness on them, that I regard the primary role and the primary value of forgiveness as about releasing the wronged party from blame feelings that can do no good. And then secondarily, which in a given instance might be just as important, might be more important, as about releasing the wrongdoer from blame feelings which are pointless for him or her, either because he's already sorry or because he'll just never get it. That's, as it were, secondary in terms of that thing can't happen without the first thing having already happened. So we've been talking a lot about interpersonal forms of forgiveness in which the end result is releasing yourself of blame feelings, among other results. Are there other forms of forgiveness that you think are related but don't follow this exact pattern? Yes, so I, I'm open to the idea that there's a whole range of practices of forgiveness, a family of different practices. And one of the things that interests me is how those different sorts of practices are related to each other. And my own view is that the most basic kind of forgiveness, the basic model, is the one we've been discussing, which is where you wrong me, I will communicate blame, and ideally you then come to share my perspective on the matter, or we come to some shared perspective on the matter, so that the blame feeling has done its job, and then I can release you from it, and release myself from it, because it's now redundant, and that is what forgiveness is. 
And I think of that as a kind of moral justice that we've gone in for. So I think of that as moral justice forgiveness. And it's characterized by a kind of psychology of demand. I'm demanding from you up front evidence that you grasp the moral significance of what you've done. I want to see that you're sorry before I'm going to let you off. That's the structure. Now, we know that there are other kinds of forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness, they're sometimes called gifted forgiveness, I like to call it, because I think it helps bring out the structure. So there's at least one kind of unconditional forgiveness, an undemanding forgiveness, which has the following form. You wrong me, and I just forgive you anyway. I forgive you up front, no demand. I specifically decide not to lay any kind of moral demands on you, and I forgive you up front as a gratuity, if you like. So instead of demanding that you deliver the goods in advance, your sorriness, your apology, your shared remorseful understanding. I just forgive you anyway. Now, one form of this is a practice whereby in the background, if not in the forgiver's psychology, there is a kind of hope or a purpose, a point, if you like, of hoped for remorseful shared understanding in the future. And the thought is that in forgiving you up front, you're somewhat startled by the fact that I've given you this gift, which normally you have to, as it were, pay for ahead of time by apology. But I've just given you this forgiveness for free. That startles people when one's on the receiving end of it. One's startled by the generosity. One's startled by the lack of moral demand. And very often it, in fact, prompts people to feel just that remorseful shared understanding that can be elusive. And so the way I see this particular practice of unconditional forgiveness is that it too has a point, a point which need not be in the psychology of the forgiver, which is in fact the same point as the point of communicated blame, namely remorseful understanding on the part of the wrongdoer and thereby a kind of shared understanding or aligned moral understandings between the two parties. And so this kind of forgiveness, very interestingly, is doing some of the work of blame. But it also, at the same time, is doing what I regard as the main point of the other kind of forgiving, which is for the hurt party to free herself of blame feeling, which is redundant. Now, why in this case is it redundant? Well, it'll be redundant so long as you, the culprit, are going to feel the shared remorseful understanding anyway in the future. Not in this case because I've demanded it of you up front, but because you're startled by the generosity of my gift and you just come to it of your own accord. And so... The way I, I mean, I recognize these are intended to be somewhat ideal models, descriptions of practices in which we're engaged and whose purposes and aims we may not share or recognize and certainly won't have in our minds as, as motives for doing it. But I think if you look at what makes sense of the practices, you see these functions intersect in this way. And I find it very helpful, not least because if we regard gifted forgiveness as having these two different points, part of the point of blame and part of the point of moral justice forgiveness, we see how the practices are interconnected. And a really interesting feature of gifted forgiveness construed in this way is that if I'm right, then it turns out that gifted forgiveness is a secondary or parasitic practice in relation to moral justice forgiveness, because you couldn't have the meanings at work in gifted forgiveness, namely your surprise at my letting you off without demanding your remorse up front, without there being background common knowledge between us, that that's unusual. Normally when you wrong someone, they stand and demand the apology before they're willing to let you go, but not this time, and that's a surprise. So the meanings at work in gifted forgiveness, which give it its power to trigger the remorse in the wrongdoer, are entirely parasitic on the meanings at work in the moral justice forgiveness case. And I find that fascinating, and I think what we learn there is not only that the moral justice forgiveness practice is conceptually prior, prior in terms of its moral meanings to gifted forgiveness, but actually it must have come historically first, because you can't have a practice come first which is conceptually dependent on a different practice. So for me that's an intriguing little moment of a piece of synthetic a priori knowledge. We suddenly learn from the armchair, because of the relations of priority at the moral meanings at work in two different practices of forgiveness, that one could not have been historically first. Maybe they can kind of evolve together, but gifted forgiveness could not have come first. And this backs up a starting conception that I am very sympathetic with, which is that where moral relations begin is in human emotions, what 
Peter Strawson called the reactive attitudes, which he regarded as absolutely basic in human nature, which is, you know, you hurt me and I feel blame feelings towards you because of the ill will that you've displayed. And if you're sorry and you repudiate the wrong, then I forgive you. That's a little pattern he describes or hypothesizes as basic in human nature, the reactive attitudes. And I think the analysis of moral justice, forgiveness, communicative blame, and gifted forgiveness that I've given kind of vindicates that starting conception, that those, those meanings of if you wrong someone, you deserve blame, but then if you're sorry, you don't deserve it anymore, are writ large in these practices, which we now see in highly culturally developed forms. But I find that very helpful to see them as all evolving out of the reactive attitudes. So we talked a lot about the ways in which blaming can turn pathological. Is that also true of forgiveness? Yes, I certainly think it is. And again, as with blame, in a way I find myself especially drawn to and intrigued by the ways in which our practices of forgiving can go wrong. Because again, so many of the ways in which they can go wrong are not due to just extraneous factors. Any practice can go wrong due to extraneous factors, but due to the nature of the internal mechanisms which make them well functioning when they do function well. So again, an intrinsic proneness to de deterioration. That I find fascinating. So for instance, I think um, in moral justice forgiveness where you're demanding the remorseful understanding up front, there are fairly obvious ways in which that can be degenerate and disproportionate. One is it can just be too angry and you're demanding too much apology, you're demanding self-abnegation on the part of the wrongdoer. Martin Nussbaum's written about this recently. Nietzsche was very aware of these points and they're really important aspects of forgiveness. And again, I think it's worth noting that there are ways in which the forgiving stance can end up doing the work of blame all over again through a back door. Now, Interestingly, I think this is also true of uh, gifted forgiveness and it's more disguised in its form with gifted forgiveness because the stance and the stance that the person is trying to adopt when they're going in for gifted forgiveness is precisely this generous, never mind that you hurt me, I'm going to let you go anyway kind of a stance. And part of the mechanism of trying to do that will be naturally kind of ignoring the resentments and blame feelings you have actually got. You're actively trying to repress them. That's what I should be doing. If I'm forgiving someone for hurting me, wronging me, I'm aware that I've got some upset feelings, some blame feelings towards them, but I want to just, for various reasons, forgive them anyway. I'm going to be actively looking away from the way I'm feeling and trying to kind of be in denial about it. Now, obviously, that mechanism can go wrong. All forms of denial can go wrong because I may not, in fact, succeed in thereby getting rid of those feelings. I may fail, but I'm busy ignoring them, and so I won't even notice my failure. And so, you know, a year later, this friendship is now ruined because of this way in which I'm in denial about the fact that I'm still angry about that thing that she did to me. But it's built into the very mechanism of trying to forgive someone that you try to repress what blame feelings you've got in order to help yourself get rid of them, but we can fail. So that's a kind of way in which we try to construct our own feelings anew when we forgive. And in fact, it's true of moral forgiveness just as much as it's true of gifted forgiveness. But that's in relation to the self. What about in relation to the person one's forgiving? Well, I think in the case of gifted forgiveness, if I'm trying to go in for gifted forgiveness towards another person, I'm also trying to take an attitude towards them which may embody a certain sort of hope that they come to see things more my way sometime in the future, even though they're not at all remorseful for it yet. But of course, this can easily degenerate into another effort of moral influence, which is more like an effort of moral control. So we can easily imagine the slightly fakely magnanimous parent or magnanimous spouse or magnanimous friends who's saying, I, I forgive you, <laughs> you know, the condescension that can be involved in saying, I forgive you, but stage whisper to self, I hope you'll come to see things correctly in the future, my dear. This can be a kind of condescension and manipulative attitude, which too easily comes in, even with the stance of gifted forgiveness, because it has this capacity for moral influence built into it through this mechanism of the wrongdoer being startled by the generous attitude directed towards her and thereby coming to be sorry. I mean, if you imagine yourself on the receiving end of someone, especially if it's someone who's got more social power than you or has some other kind of asymmetry of power, perhaps they're your parent, perhaps they're 
your boss or perhaps you're in a society where people like them have a lot of privilege and people like you don't, they forgive you for something. That's a more powerful thing <laughs> and a thing that's more prone to condescension than it would be between equals. So I think the more you have unequal power relations in a society, the more likely relations of forgiveness between those different groups are going to be prone to condescension, manipulation, presumptions that the way, forgive, the, way the forgiver sees things is the correct way and so on. And the act of forgiveness might have more power than it deserves in those circumstances. So. So these are just some ways that I think gifted forgiveness in particular, but both kinds of forgiveness in other ways can, can go wrong. And they're really exacerbated by unequal power relations. Why do you think it's important to get clear about the purpose of blame and the purpose of forgiveness and what it is for blame to work and what it is for it to fail, and so too for forgiveness? Um, how does that help, having a better understanding of these things? Well, I'd like to think that one of the useful things that philosophical models of these practices can do, and especially asking what's their point, what's their purpose? When does it serve a progressive purpose and when does it serve a more regressive purpose? One of the things that can do is help us be more self-conscious and in fact more autonomous in terms of the particular forms of these practices that we go in for and when we choose to go in for them. So to recognize the contingency of the particular practices of blaming and forgiving that one has been born into in a given cultural moment is enormously, enormously empowering because you think, well, does it do any good, actually, this kind of blame? Is it proportionate? Do I have to blame all the time when somebody wrongs me? What I've been suggesting is that philosophy can show us that it's not compulsory. It'll serve a certain positive purpose in some circumstances, but in other circumstances, while we may still have the reflex to blame, it might actually be better just to forget about the whole thing, not go there with the communicated blame, not go there maybe even with the judgment. And we can be in charge of that, and we can acknowledge that we'll have reasons to just let some things go on some occasions when somebody wrongs us. Why? Because I don't want to be that angry person, or because we recognize it will do more harm than good to engage in blame in that way. And similarly, we can recognize that it's best just to go ahead with the forgiveness even though they're not remorseful yet because of who I want to be and how I want to live my life. And these thoughts allow this sort of secular way of understanding these practices and their point to connect with certain Buddhist ideas and other sorts of as it were, anti-blame ideas which are designed to liberate us from a kind of obligation to go in for blame. I think it's right to recognize that blaming each other and even forgiving each other, too, takes energy, takes time. Sometimes it's a life's project to forgive someone for what they've done to you. And it can be a perfectly sane response under certain circumstances to just blank a moral wrong. Just let it go. Just forget that person, not morally engaged, trying to figure out the rights and wrongs of it, figure out how to forgive them and let them go, but rather just to decide, draw a line. Now, that, too, I emphasize, is a kind of policy that can go very wrong, wrong and will have its own pathologies. Of course, my deciding to just not go there with some blame when somebody's wronged me and just drop the whole thing, blanket from my life, can be a kind of just cowardice or denial in disguise. And we have to adjudicate these things. They're all difficult decisions. But what I like to think is that doing philosophy, doing moral philosophy in this way, where you're looking at the practices and what they can achieve, helps us be more self-conscious, helps equip us for the very heterogeneous kinds of reasons for and against blaming, for and against forgiving in this or that mode, which make a decision a good decision. The moral meanings of what we do and what others do, I think of as pretty much public and fixed. Whether it was wrong that she behaved in that way, that's just as it were a matter of public moral meaning. But whether we engage in it and try to exert influence on someone because of what they've done, or try to change ourselves because of how we think it would be good to forgive them. That's a choice. It's a choice about how we use our moral energies. And I like the idea of making sense of the possibility that sometimes there are better things to do than to morally engage. Miranda Fricker, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I hope you can forgive us for asking you all these questions. <laughs> you are forgiven. If you have any questions about today's episode, give us a holler on Twitter at, at @elucidationspod. And as always, you can post a comment to our blog at Lucian, that's L U C I A N, lucian.uchicago.edu/blogs/elucidations.
On the blog, you can also explore our full back catalog of previous episodes. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>